I'll be very brief about this. Thank you for coming. Uh, I think there are two points. First of all, the best of, of today is that there are a whole bunch of people here who are simply here as honest-to-goodness members of the public because they signed up and wanted to see this. And we can't tell you how pleased we are that you are here and that you have a chance to see what you will see. There are so many different issues to, to talk about with uh, respect to the viaduct, but the most important of them is we must do something. And when you see what you will see today, you will see that we must do something. And if you can take that message back to whomever you speak with in your family or in your neighborhood or wherever you go, that would be a great, great contribution to all of our need to move forward. What will we do? When we decide that we must do something, we are in fact going to agree on what we're going to do. And it's not going to be all that hard once we are driven by the notion that we must do something because this is not the future. So thank you for coming and helping us show you that and helping us tell other people that. And again, for all of you who just had a chance to come today, we're just pleased to have you here, more than I can say. Greg? Thank you, Doug. Doug and I have worked uh, very hard together these last three years to inform the public as to the, um, the danger that this viaduct poses to our transportation and economic future. We have worked very hard together and our staffs have worked very hard together as a team to come up with the alternatives that we're looking at currently and we're working very hard together to come to an answer, a solution that we'll be presenting to the public a little bit later this fall. What you see behind us is both a, uh, a huge challenge and an incredible opportunity for the state of Washington and for the city of Seattle. Uh, it came about as a result of the uh, Nisqually earthquake in 2001 where the earth, earth moved the viaduct. And on a couple of occasions since then, the viaduct has moved all on its own. And we believe that the replacement of this uh, facility in one of the options that um, uh, we've been looking at is absolutely essential for the transportation future of this region and for the economic future. Uh, last week I had the opportunity to join with uh, seven other mayors from around America at uh, an institute uh, for on city design. We each gave a case study about what was happening in our city and the opportunities that we saw and I chose the replacement of this viaduct and the incredible opportunity we have to open our city back up to the waterfront. In the 1900s, a decision was made that the waterfront was not a place for people, it was a place for industry. Today, it is a place for people, but we still have the remnants of the uh, 20th century uh, that make it not as good a place for people. That new front porch, that new opening of the city to the world is an incredible opportunity that this huge challenge behind, behind us presents us. We want you to take a look at the viaduct today and we want to thank you for joining us. Take a look at the damage that was done. Take a look at the opportunity that it creates for us. Uh, and uh, let's get the show on the road. We're going to ask the press. If you've got some questions, stay behind. We're going to ask the folks in the various different sections to uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, start kicking the tires, but please don't kick them too hard. Thank you. your name, if you spell it, tell us what your title is, please. Uh, Maureen Sullivan, M-A-U-R-E-E-N-S-U-L-L-I-V-A-N, Project Director, State Washington Department of Transportation. Okay. Uh, explain what's going on here today. Today is our semi-annual inspection of the viaduct. It's to uh, look at a variety of things. Uh, we have crack gauges to see if there's any cracks gotten bigger, has there been any further settlement. The area right behind me, in fact, is an area that settled up to four inches right across from Coleman Dock over the last couple of years. It's a special area we're monitoring. Uh, we're also doing some maintenance activities as long as we have this closure. Okay. Uh, we did this uh, earlier in the year. Uh, are we looking for differences between then and now, or what else are we looking for today? We're both looking at difference from that last time, and we're also looking at overall changes. Uh, the area that it settled, uh, we have a plan of action should it go another couple of inches. We frankly don't anticipate that it will. It hasn't moved for a year, but we want to be very careful about that. 
Uh, another th thing that continues to deteriorate is the concrete uh, on the facility. So we're uh, any loose we're getting rid of and patching and that sort of thing. We also look at expansion joints. That's the metal piece on the ground to ensure that that hasn't gone together. That's not a good sign. Uh, it needs to have room to breathe. Uh, when this was made back in, back in the 50s, I know uh, things at that point were like, make it very rigid and that'll be good. Now everything's based on having it being flexible and give, and so right. we're, seeing, we're seeing that. That's right. There is, there is some flexibility in the facility. Um, there are a couple things we don't do this way anymore, as it was done in the 50s. We've learned a lot about earthquakes over the last 50 years, and uh, so you don't do hollow columns. Uh, you, you strengthen them differently. Uh, the, some of it was built a little bit on the cheap. It was done not very long after the war, so um, some recycled parts and things were done. We do that differently now. Uh, what other inroads have been made uh, since, and, you know, since we've <laughs> looked at this previously in terms of other options or whatever else is going on with this? We've looked at five alternatives to replace the facility, an all-surface option, a small tunnel, a uh, rebuild the facility pretty much like it is today, an aerial, a little bit wider, wider lanes, wider shoulders, and a full tunnel option. We in the last uh, couple of months now have narrowed it to two key options, rebuilding the facility or replacing it with the tunnel. Okay. Can you give us a brief little uh, audio tour of what we're going to be looking at today? Uh, we have basically, we we've, we've have six stations set up. Uh, one of them is to basically show the full vulnerability of not only the viaduct but the seawall. The seawall is an integral piece of this. This is why we partner with the city because the city has, is responsible for the seawall, the state's responsible for the viaduct, so we partner together. Uh, another is to show an area where we did repairs, emergency repairs after the um, Disqually quake. A third area is to show where there are crack gauges and uh, the uh, column problems. Uh, another area is to show where the expansion joints and the concrete. Uh, we have another station that shows um, uh, there's been a question about uh, replacing uh, the viaduct with not replacing it at all, basically. And we have a station showing what that told us in some traffic studies we did. And the final station is showing the five alternatives. Okay, great. Anything else I haven't finished or touched on? You did good. You okay. covered it all. Okay. Very good. <laughs> about the vulnerabilities of the viaduct, uh, how it relates to the seawall and the soils below it. So a lot of people ask, you know, why don't we just retrofit the viaduct? Why don't we fix up the, quote, bad places, the bad joints, whatever they are? First of all, there's a lot of them. There's 186 spans, you know, two and a little over two miles of structure to fix. Looking at it from, if you turn around and look to the north, you would see a cross section through the viaduct. We're standing right in this area. And the problems are the cross beams, and the connection between the cross beams and the columns. You can see some of the cracks that are going on here. That's not really a good thing. Uh, the connection between the lower cross beam and the columns in this area, the connection between the column and the footing, the connection between the footing and the piling, there are joints in the piling, and then the connection between the piling and the ground. In this area, we reach the, what I'll call terra firma or the hard pan solid ground. Down in the south end, the hard pan is down like 200 feet the piling don't reach that far. So if there's an earthquake, all this soil can liquefy. The other issue is the seawall itself. When people see the seawall, they see the outside of it. What they don't realize is the relieving platform. This is down about 13 feet under Alaskan Way City Street. This is made out of untreated timber. And the gribbles have gotten in there and chewed away and messed up this connection. So there's places where the seawall itself and the relieving platform, as near as we can tell, aren't even attached. In these pictures, you can see this is before the seawall was built. So again, this is looking north, and you can see that it was all piling and so forth. It shows this area that was all filled in when they built the seawall and before the viaduct, 1934. They dug down a hole a couple years ago, 13 feet down, about 10 feet square, and looked at the connections. These are the actual timbers standing down there. 
Good catch, thank you. Um, and that's the seawall behind. These are supposed to be 12 inch by 14 inch timbers. They're almost <laughs> nibbled away. And that's this connection right here, looking down on it. So with that, the, the scenarios for uh, problems with the viaduct, one, the earthquake can shake fairly rapidly, fairly hard, and distress these joints and connections on the structure itself. If it's a little bit slower and longer time, the soils underneath can liquefy and the joints down here can fail, or in the area in the south where the piling don't reach all the way, the viaduct can do what's called plunging, which means it sinks. That would not be good. The other problem is the seawall itself is almost at about the same vulnerability, as near as we can tell, as the viaduct. So when this soil liquefies, this seawall heads towards the sea. When it goes, the ground's going to follow it. It's all like uh, quicksand. It takes the foundations of the viaduct with it, and so the viaduct falls. So that, in a nutshell, is one of the reasons it's not too easy to fix it. The problem with the viaduct itself is it was designed when the earthquake standards were for 0.1 side of force of gravity. The current is 0.3, so there's just not enough steel in there. It's not like you can just go in and fix up what's there. It's not only the fact that it's getting close to 50 years old, but there just wasn't enough put in there in the first place. Is all of that an argument that constructing a tunnel would be a safer long-term solution? Because um, you wouldn't have all that. No, and the, the short answer is yes, tunnels perform better in an earthquake than structures do, and it's mostly what I call the flagpole effect. If you ever shake a flagpole, you know, they do this. So they perform better just by their nature. However, if we built a new structure or a new tunnel or a new anything, we would build it to codes and build it strong enough to withstand current earthquakes. It's mostly the fact that when it was built in 1950s, we didn't realize, we didn't know about the Seattle Fault, we didn't know how big the earthquakes were. Describe the settling that occurred during the Nisqually, after the Nisqually quake. Sure. Actually, the best station for that is Dave's over here across the way. He's got a graph that shows it. But what's happened is, and we don't know why, because these columns actually reach down to good ground. We've got the old pile driving records. We know exactly what's down there. But somehow, this has gone down some number of inches. And it's this joint right here and this expansion joint. I don't want to steal Dave's thunder, but okay. if you look up in between, that expansion joint is supposed to be an inch and a half, probably more than that in the cool weather. It's almost nothing right now, maybe a quarter of an inch up there. Yeah, because one of it kind of took it down. What's happened is with the frames, as it sunk, as these sunk, and looking the other way, is the frames have come together like that, and it's pushing. So when it gets hot, those can't move. So it not only puts huge stresses on those areas where it's touching, but it's bending all these frames in ways they weren't supposed to be bent. So uh, I love this. Is question for here, but the five alternatives, two are tunnels, and this one of these road. others in the cross section, but it's built essentially in this area. But we want the other three alternatives. Are we talking about oh. if you did an aerial or a Oh, rebuild? if you How built the aerial, the seawall would be rebuilt um, with a new wall. And I'm trying to remember, there's three ways to do it. There's a tieback direction. One of the things that we've noticed at this particular lo location is that there's been a, a fair amount of movement that has occurred since this quality. Now, one of the things that was supposed to occur as a result of this quality, based on the amount of energy that the earthquake generated, was there's supposed to be a lot of liquefaction that occurred down here. We did not see that. But what we did see as we began to do subsequent monitoring was there was some settlement, and it, and it was rather curious because the settlement began to occur in 2002 and 2003, now well after the earthquake had left. And so we began to think, well, there's got to be something else going on underneath here that 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 may be uh, affecting our foundations because the the structure itself, the the, the superstructure, isn't moving. It's got to be within the ground. So our records went back and 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 we found that in after the big fire in 1889, they apparently had pushed a lot of the wood debris down into this area. They just bulldozed it right down Yesler and deposited it in this area. But we all know and we all understand that. Seattle was formed by pushing fill out of the tide flats. In this particular location, there's actually 20 feet of, of wood debris and ash that's underneath these locations. And so the theory is now is that that material is consolidating and it may have been uh, mobilized a little bit by the earthquake, um, but 
but as that continues to consolidate, it is putting pressure on the foundations and it's trying to pull the foundations down into the ground. So this is a little bit of a concern for us because it's not something that, that, that was, we believe that was entirely as a, func a function of the earthquake. It is something that is going to persist. Now, fortunately, the surveys that our the preservation guys are doing right now, they have, they have found that there's not been any movement in 2004, which is good. Right now, this is where we're standing here. This is the amount of settlement that's occurred since the first readings were taken in 2001 after the event. We've seen about four inches of settlement. At the station down the way here, where you see all the retrofitting of the columns, at that location, they had about six inches of settlement that they monitored, okay? They fixed that area. Our concern was, if this continued to move, another couple inches, we would have to do the same thing at this location. Fortunately, the movement stopped. The piles seem to have, have uh, collected some more capacity, and now they're holding the, and now they're holding still. So we're gonna continue to monitor it. That's why we're out here this weekend. If we see any movement, the DOT has a plan in place to retrofit this vent and vent 93. These are these two, these two columns right here, and to shore them up and to prevent any more movement should it occur. You guys have any questions? Was there any lateral movement as well as vertical? There, very little. Very little lateral inches that we saw vertically. Um, that was a bit of a concern because as the, as the structure rotates, it, it places more concentrations of stress in certain points. And uh, um, all geotechnical engineers... Give us an update. What are we seeing here today? What's going on? Well, today we're conducting a, an inspection that happens every six months. We shut the viaduct down. We measure whether there's been additional movement since the last, uh, the last inspection and what action needs to be taken either to repair or potentially at some point restrict weights on the viaduct. And we're taking an opportunity to help educate the public as to what's happened with the structure and why the decisions that are coming up on replacing it are so important. Uh, give us a little bit update on uh, some of the alternatives, so, so just sort of narrowing it down. Yeah, there have been uh, roughly five alternatives, six alternatives that have been studied from doing nothing, maybe just tearing down the viaduct, to uh, rebuilding the seawall, which is critical under any of the options, and putting the traffic underground and reclaiming the waterfront. So a decision will be made in the next couple of months uh, as to which alternative to move forward with. And then the challenge will be getting the money uh, from the federal and state governments to make it happen. This is a project of huge magnitude. It city, is. Uh, with the seawall replacement being sort of part right. of the package because of it going away and whatnot. Um, talk about that a little bit. Well, uh, in fact, I, I would suggest that this is a project of national significance. The movement of freight in the Port of Seattle is nationally important. This is one of the two largest uh, uh, terminals on the West Coast, one of the four largest in America. So having the ability to move those freight, uh, that freight in an efficient ma manner is very important to our economy. Secondly, we have companies like Boeing that have to move parts and people uh, from the north plants to the to the south the operations they have. 
Uh, so it is a project of national significance. And we've asked the federal government as they renew their transportation program to recognize that and set money aside. And we're getting results. Uh, the House has set aside $6.6 .6 billion for projects like this. The Senate is, is beginning to talk uh, in a similar fashion. So we've got their attention. This is a state highway. And the state has the fundamental responsibility to operate a safe facility. So at a minimum, they're going to be responsible for replacing what's here now. And uh, so we see a partnership where the federal government recognizes national significance, the state fixes it, and if we want to do something more to reclaim our waterfront, regionally we come up with a difference. Okay. This is a project that uh, some people have said is like changing the tire on the car without stopping the car to change the tire. Obviously yeah. we don't want to there's going to be a situation where you're going to be dumping a lot of traffic back on the I-5 right. while this is going on. Talk about that a little bit. It's very important that the amount of time the viaduct is out of service is minimal. Uh, West Seattle, Ballard, the industrial area, we all rely on it every day. And those who don't use it every day will find they can't go east-west if the viaduct traffic is uh, snarl north-south, wherever that might be. So we'd have gridlock. Uh, so the key is to replace the seawall, put in the replacement while the viaduct is still standing and operating, and then remove the viaduct. That allows us, while it'll still be a lot of dirt and dust and disruption, to do it in the least painful fashion, I think. Okay. Uh, one more question. There's a lot of romance in the viaduct. Because <laughs> you get one of the best views of Seattle. Oh, absolutely. Oh, on a, on a winter morning after a snow in the Olympics, uh, you know, if it's not raining, it's gorgeous. I love it. It's one of the things that I get up and really look forward to. Uh, but the opportunity to reconnect the city with the water is going to benefit more people than, than the wonderful view you get from the, from the top of the viaduct when you're going northbound. Plus, as drivers, shouldn't we really be paying attention to the road and not the, uh, and not the mountains? So I will miss that view. I know that's one of the arguments. But there's a greater good to be served here, I think, and that is to, to take out what made sense in the 1950s and doesn't make sense in the 21st century. Okay, just one more question. Uh, where Seattle is unique in that we have a deep water port yes. at our front door, right. it's not in some other part of the town. You just can't build deep water ports right. and talk about the connection to our trade and ports and being in the downtown. In the 50s, the uh, waterfront was an industrial waterfront uh, the whole length. And the viaduct made sense. You didn't really want to be there. It was noisy and smelly and dirty. Uh, it's changed. It's now a hub. The Coleman Dock brings in about 14 million people a year into our and out of our downtown. So lots and lots of people use it. And removing the viaduct in a fashion that allows the movement of, of, of traffic and, and commerce uh, really gives us an opportunity very few cities have, a waterfront that is dynamic and urban and a great place to be, uh, as well as the kind of uh, infrastructure you need for a healthy economy. Thank you very much.
bridge rail system or, or do something because that really over time will actually weaken the rail system. Railing. I mean, what what will it would it actually stop? Does that is it strong enough to stop a car? Yes. Uh, your name and spell it in your title, okay. we have that information, right? Oh, I'm, I'm uh, Paul Crane, landscape architect here, and uh, just part of the uh, uh, groups that uh, came up with some ideas during the shred process, both the Allied Arts Collaborative and uh, the City of Seattle uh, shred, which was about 300 plus uh, architects, landscape architects, designers, planners, etc. And, and one of the ideas that came out was a, an urban trail. Uh, and I think today what we've seen is the beautiful views that you get from this viaduct. If this was ever turned into a, a, an urban trail, if we go with a cut and cover and wanted to reuse the viaduct. Uh, we, we see people walking around. It's interesting to ask them uh, about their uh, thoughts about the views and, and, and using this as an urban trail. Could this be sort of a permanent uh, street fair? or? Uh, it could be uh, any venue you'd want it to be. Uh, a market, a uh, place to walk, ride your bike. It would be up and above uh, what's there now. Uh, I wouldn't suggest keeping all of it because it is a, it is a wall. It is an ugly, an ugly fixture. But there's parts of it that can be used uh, where we have on ramps and off ramps. Just some ideas, ideas that came out of the charrette. Something to consider. But if we had a chance without the traffic to live without the noise, and to kind of see the views you get from this level. So that's about what I have to add. Thank you. Thank you very much.